For more than a century, the lives of the Windsors have enthralled the nation, mesmerized the press, and inspired some of the most popular films and dramas of recent decades. But what's fact and what's fiction? There were rumors that not everything was right in the marriage. He was only on extremely loose terms with monogamy. That was the moment when the palace absolutely lost grip of the narrative. In this series, we delve deep into the archives to reveal controversial documents concealed for decades. This is a handwritten note saying, we're going to tap the king's phone. And meet royal insiders who witnessed history firsthand. She steps out and we realise this is a horror story. I'm about four feet from the princess. It was the first sign something was wrong. In this episode, we look at the perpetual conflict for the royal family between love and duty. One of the hardest challenges of being a royal is marriage. You're not just marrying a person, you're marrying a job. There is this added component, there is this duty thing. After the fairy tale wedding comes a reality which has seen three out of four of the Queen's children divorced. We were living a life that the marriage was pretty much dead. The Queen and Prince Philip, however, have reconciled both love and duty. It has been the great royal love story. He calls her cabbage, for goodness sake. 72 years is a very, very long marriage. But what Prince Philip said, I think, is the key, which is tolerance. But will the next generation be able to do the same in the pressure cooker of the modern monarchy? The fact that I, the fact that I fell in love with Meghan so incredibly quickly was a, was a sort of confirmation to me that, that everything, every, all the stars were aligned, everything was just perfect. It was this beautiful woman just sort of literally tripped and fell into my life. I <laughs> fell into her life. Meghan and Harry are an incredibly tactile couple. There's a lovely chemistry between them, and without a doubt, it has increased Harry and Meghan's popularity. You know, they suddenly seem more real than royal. Love has never seemed more important to the royal family's popularity, but it's only part of the picture. I know the fact that she'll be unbelievably good at the job part of it as well um, is obviously a huge, huge relief to me because she'll be able to deal with with everything else that comes with it. I really believe that William and Harry have learnt a lot of lessons from watching their parents' marriage. Diana told William and Harry to marry. William is completely devoted to Kate. They're clearly very much in love. They make a great team. But the big difference was that William knew Kate before they married one another. They were at university together. They shared a house together as flatmates before they started going out. So there was a long courtship. And I think that she'd been sort of inducted into the family and knew what she was getting into. Harry's marriage to Meghan was more of a whirlwind affair. Here is Prince Harry. He's married an American, he's married a divorcee. And without a doubt, this has been a very fast-moving royal romance. Yes, behind the scenes, there were some questions being asked, just to make sure that Harry was sure, because, of course, you know, divorce is something that has tainted the House of Windsor. The spectre of divorce has been hanging over the Windsor dynasty since 1936, when Edward VIII chose love over duty and abdicated rather than give up Wallace Simpson. The same loyal welcome, the amazing scenes of enthusiasm that mark him as undoubtedly deserving his well-earned title, the most popular man in the world. Despite his huge crowd appeal, Edward VIII was, behind the scenes, obsessed by Mrs. Simpson. Wallace Simpson was an American adventuress, in the words of Queen Mary. She absolutely captivated, entranced, um, bewitched him. Even though Wallace was still married to her second husband, the king was determined to make her his wife. This put him at loggerheads with the Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin. He said to Baldwin that he was going to marry her, and Baldwin said, well, look, this, this simply isn't on. Um, Parliament won't wear it. The king responded that he would marry Mrs. Simpson without government approval and, if necessary, abdicate. What Edward VIII did was to say, I have to be with the woman I love, and that takes priority over everything.
Royal biographer Robert Hartman has spent his career examining the decisions the royal family make. His investigations at the National Archives at Kew have uncovered secrets about the abdication kept under wraps for over 80 years. Everyone from the Prime Minister down was extremely worried about the state of the King's mind, which way he was going to go. This is an extraordinary document from senior Home Office official to the head of the post office saying, we're going to tap the King's phone. You will arrange for the interception of telephone communications between Fort Belvedere, certain addresses in London, and the continent of Europe. This is effectively saying, yes, he is our, because we feel it's in the national interest. Mrs. Simpson has all sorts of dubious contacts and friendships, not least with German diplomats. The King was known to have met leading members of the British fascist movement. They want to know it all. And indeed, it was later discovered that it was an MI5 operative hiding in a bush in Green Park, listening to these phone conversations. You actually heard the first conversation where the, the King Edward VIII told his brother, Duke of York, that he was going to abdicate. The public only knew about it on the 3rd of December, and by the 10th, 11th of December, the King had gone. On the 12th of December, his brother was proclaimed George VI, and Edward left the country. He married Wallace in France in 1937. None of his family attended the wedding. Putting love over duty had changed the course of British history. None of them had been prepared for this. They'd been prepared for a life of living in a country house with horses and dogs, and that's basically what young Elizabeth wanted to do. That's what she was prepared for. She wanted to be a country lady. Just a decade later, the girl who had hoped to live a quiet life in the country had fallen in love, and the palace thought her choice, Prince Philip of Greece, was also unsuitable. There was this strand of British establishment thinking that he was a slightly dangerous outsider from, a, from a, a foreign royal house. The Greek royal family had been imported from Denmark, and so Prince Philip is not actually Greek at all. He has quite a lot of German and Russian blood in him. When he was just a baby, Philip's family went to live as impoverished exiles in Paris, and soon after, the Greek royal family were deposed. He was very much a man who had to make his own way in life. He said to me once that his mother was ill and his father was away, so he said, I had to get on with it. Get on with it, he did. Luckily for Philip, he was rescued by his extended family. His mother's brother, Louis Mountbatten, helped transform Philip's fortunes by encouraging him to join the Royal Navy. He'd come up through this school of hard knocks and he'd been very successful. He was good-looking, he was um, extremely attractive to women, and he caught the eye of Princess Elizabeth at Dartmouth. And Philip was a naval cadet, and he impressed the girls. He jumped over a tennis net, and then as the royal yacht was leaving, he went behind it in a rowing boat. 13 years Elizabeth fell in love with Philip at Dartmouth Naval College. But her mother was less enamoured. Queen Mother would have much preferred her to marry a grenadier guard and indeed spent quite a lot of time putting grenadier guards in her path. After the Zesh, the Queen Mother saw him as a Hunnish Junker with all sorts of very embarrassing Nazi relations. But the determined princess saw something in the dashing young naval officer and remained resolute. She was still very young, and so the king took them all off to South Africa on the African tour. George VI had agreed they could marry, as long as his daughter waited until they came back to announce her engagement. One of the most welcome features of the royal train which transported the family across South Africa was the post office carriage with its telephone exchange. A vital lifeline to Philip. She was strikingly in love with him and made it clear. He certainly saw the advantages of marrying into the House of Windsor. Somebody described him as a, a, a big dog wanting a basket. The Queen's was a love match which endured, but fast forward a generation and her son felt impelled to sacrifice love on the altar of duty. What I do remember is as the weeks passed, Diana became thinner and thinner and thinner. 
By the time they walked up the aisle, the relationship was in a very, very bad way. In 1980, Prince Charles was 32 and the pressure was on for him to marry and produce an heir. In a way, it was the last marriage played out by old royal rules that the Prince of Wales had to find a suitable bride, a young aristocratic virgin bride. And of course, Diana Spencer ticked all these boxes. Everybody loved her. She was funny, she was uncomplicated, but the reality was actually rather different. It was the most curious engagement, really. They didn't know one another. Diana was taken out of her lovely flat where she, which she shared with bubbly girls. And she was given a suite of rooms at Buckingham Palace. And the perfect girl Charles thought he was falling in love with was much darker and was much more moody. And by the time they walked up the aisle, the relationship was in a very, very bad way. An interview filmed on the eve of the wedding exposes the state of their relationship. What sort of reactions have you encountered to your marriage? Oh, the most uh, overwhelming uh, and touching reactions as far as uh, we've been concerned. There's your vows. Mm. That's the most personal moment. And, and hardly any sort of eye contact. Is it going to be that for you, even though you know the eyes of the world are watching you at that very important moment? Well, I hope so, yes. I, mean, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about... People often say, why did Charles not marry Camilla when he had the opportunity? When they first met, when they were young, both were single. But Camilla was in love with Andrew Parker Bowles. Charles, I think, fell very much in love with her. But actually, he, he didn't ask her to marry him. But, I, you know, I don't know that she would have accepted if he had done. Charles always said that when he married, he would marry with his head and not his heart. And that, I think, was a hangover from, from the lesson learnt from Edward's abdication. It could not be a passion that swept him away. I suspect they quite quickly found that they weren't ideally suited to each other, but unfortunately the world had fallen in love with her. Charles and Diana's wedding was to be the biggest national celebration since the coronation, with Lady Di in the starring role. Everything was huge about it. St Paul's, because it could take this enormous crowd. A wedding dress that practically covered the steps. It was the sort of surrogate love affair for the nation. It seemed to be a completely romantic wedding. Of course, we didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. Prince Charles' goddaughter, India Hicks, was one of the five bridesmaids and witnessed the feverish speculation surrounding the wedding dress. They were extraordinary, an extraordinary experience for a 13-year-old child. Whenever we turned up for dress fittings, the organisation of the car coming up and the world's press descending and trying to get any snap. When we were actually inside the Emmanuel's studio, I remember they had blocked out a lot of the windows because, of course, cameras had camped out on neighbouring buildings with long lenses to spy inside to see what the world's greatest fashion secret was going to look like. There was a feeling of fun around it all. We would be on the floor above, she would be in the floor below. It's passed. Diana became thinner and thinner and thinner and they had to take the dress in and in and in. And so there was a lot of scurrying around to make sure that dress was fitting her. You got pretty close to Diana during those times, and there was always this feeling of Diana being the head girl. And we were 
in awe of her. And looking back, you think, my God, she was 19. She was just a child herself. Um, but as a 13-year-old, I was quite impressed, quite impressed by her. During the dress fittings, this beautiful silk taffeta felt very princessy and very fairy tale -ish. Of course, what no one had tested or anticipated was cramming that amount of fabric in a very small carriage. Her father herself, her dress and the 25-foot train trot gloriously down the mall as the world watches. The carriage draws up and the trumpeters are trumpeting the horses and the atmosphere was sensational and the crowds are going crazy. And the carriage door is opened by the footman and she steps out. And of course the train then begins to unfold itself and we realize this is a horror story. It is just 25 feet of crumpled mess. And so Sarah Armstrong Jones and I just set to work and really all you see of me is my bottom in the air. I'm bending down trying to undo this. There was a great ball afterwards at Buckingham Palace and I was so excited. That was gonna be my first ball. And after Charles and Diane's wedding, we went home and I lay down for a moment, just a moment. And I woke up to discover my whole family had gone to the ball and I had been left alone in the house. I was livid. I was so cross. Why had they not woken me? And my mother thought, oh, she's so tired, we'll leave her behind. I thought, bloody hell, I've missed the ball. In contrast to the extravagance of Charles and Diana's wedding, when Elizabeth and Philip got married in 1947... People felt that they hadn't had the rewards that they should have got as a result of victory. And all of a sudden, this great event took place, the marriage of the future Queen of England. And it was, as Churchill said, a great flash of colour in a period of grim, grey, dark, gloomy austerity. People are standing in queues, rationing. People really have not enough to eat. In keeping with the straightened times, the Prime Minister refused to make the wedding day a national holiday. The royals themselves wondered whether a private ceremony out at Windsor, maybe, would be more appropriate. Robert Hardman has sifted through dozens of documents at the National Archives that show a government determined to economize. It's two years after the end of the Second World War. The country's broke, and there's no money for anything. And what you see here is the extraordinary extent to which the government is going to try and scrimp and save on everything. This is October. One month to go, and the palace are finally approving a press stand, £275. Six-foot red carpet from the west door to the Sacrarium steps. There's a debate going on about whether they're going to have new blue carpet in Westminster Abbey for £100. Well, there's a second-hand red carpet that might be used, which would be £83. Um, although someone else has found another red carpet that might do for £75. While other couples couldn't afford to get married, there were inevitably concerns about wasting money. Here is a letter of complaint from a branch of the Labour Party saying there can be no undue expense on anything. This has got to be an austerity wedding. It's intolerable for any substantial quantity of labour or materials to be diverted. Justified indignation. The British people will be discouraged in the immense efforts that they are making towards our economic recovery if this wedding is made the occasion for displaying a vast inequality of sacrifice. But in the end, the public didn't have the appetite for a wedding done on the cheap, and they wanted to play a part in making it a day to remember. Wedding gifts were sent from all over the world and displayed at St James's Palace. And huge numbers of people turned 
up to see them. A lot of people abroad thought Britain was starving, so a lot of people sent the princess food. She received something like 500 tins of pineapple. A lady in Brooklyn sent a turkey. She also received 148 pairs of stockings. And a couple of kittens sent by um, a pair of district nurses. Clyde Bank Council decided it'd be a good idea to send her a sewing machine. Oh, and Gandhi sent uh, a... Famously, thought mistook it for a loincloth and complained about the indelicacy. Hundreds of sympathetic women across the country sent including coupons for the wedding dress. Designed by Norman Hartnell, it was an exquisite austerity miracle, complete with 15-foot train. Oh, look at all that. I love the dress. It was beautiful sort of satin. And I think there was a huge lily somewhere. And it was embroidered with sequins. I just remember it being lovely for her. Lady Mary Goldman is the Queen Mother's niece and the Queen's cousin. She's never spoken about the Queen in public before. Now, at 87, she's agreed to remember that joyous day back in 1947. We were 14, my twin and I, and we were at boarding school. <clears throat> and the thought of coming up to London was dread instead of excitement, because it was sort of unknown. I remember the whole thing, the crowds, they were just so enthusiastic. You just gasped when you saw them all waving their flags. And... You know, after the war, it was sort of such a break to have some happiness. The ceremony was very touching. The Archbishop said that in many ways this was just like the wedding of an ordinary couple in all the Yorkshire Dales. She looked as if she could almost see heaven. She was really happy. It was wonderful. And he looked happy too. So that's good. I remember being glad that we were there. Following the king and queen in the procession, Princess Andrew of Greece, the queen of the Hellenes, and the boy king of Iraq. The people who couldn't come to the wedding, rather tellingly, were Prince Philip's sisters, because all of his surviving sisters had been married to German nobility, who played an active part in the Nazi cause, so they couldn't possibly make an appearance. It was that close to the war. There was a great feeling of euphoria suddenly, a, a release of tension, a feeling that things could only get better. Seldom has a bride and groom as a nation instead of looking back. And it was a turning point for the monarchy, no question. But in just a few years, Princess Margaret's love for a married man would threaten to undermine the bright new era for the royal family. People were very shocked. They felt he'd taken advantage. The Queen's private secretary said to Townsend, you must be either mad or bad. Ken Lennox photographed the royal family for over half a century and took the first grainy photograph of Anna with Charles on the banks of the River Dee in 1980. He got to know Lady Di, trying to capture her on camera outside her Earl's Court flat. I couldn't give away photographs of the royal family before Diana came on the scene. When Diana came along, all that exploded. Ken was to photograph the princess for the rest of her life. This is the honeymoon photo call. The couple walked up, sat in a little style, and really full of affection. Uh, they answered questions, and they were hugging in front of the cameras. We'd never seen royals doing an official photocall like that. But there's not only an age difference, but there's a mind difference between the way they thought life should be. Prince Charles worried about so many things, and Diana was young and wanted to have a young woman's life, and I think Charles found that quite difficult. I think that Diana was genuinely 
genuinely in love with Prince Charles at the beginning, but Prince Charles didn't respond. I think they were incompatible characters was the basic problem. Ken was part of the Royal Press Pack for their first overseas tour of Australia and New Zealand in 1983. Before Diana going to scene, it was Prince Charles was the most photographable royal. He was action man, and there was choruses of girls crying out for him. I felt sorry for Charles now, because no one wanted to see him. This time, Charles would work one side of the street and Diana the other, and Charles, they would just say to him, sir, can you get your wife to come over here? And from being Mr. Popular to Mr. Please, can you bring your wife over here? It was not a happy situation for him. I'm about four feet from the princess, and I'm trying to get a bit of the opera house in the background and some of the crowd. And Diana burst into tears and wept for a couple of minutes. After it was over, I went to see the press officer for the Prince and Prince on. So I just accepted that. Charles, I don't think, has noticed at that stage, you know. If he has, typically Prince Charles to look the other way. <laughs> but it was the first sign of something was wrong. And we then began to see other things happening later on. You could tell by the mid-80s that things were not particularly good. It wasn't hostility, but it was just the sense that everything wasn't right. The idea that there could be actually anything seriously wrong with the marriage was unthinkable. It had to work, and it was our job to make it work, or at least appear to work. Patrick Jeffson was equerry and private secretary to the Princess of Wales for eight years, with responsibility for her household and he witnessed the problems that were not yet apparent to the public. As professional royal performers, they were unbeatable. But behind the scenes, it was quite different. They didn't talk to each other. There was the minimum of eye contact. They were short-tempered with each other. Diana, of course, being who she was, uh, enjoyed upstaging her husband. And if she was laughing more, smiling more, it wasn't just because she was happy and smiley, it was also because she knew that it got on his nerves. I remember on one particular occasion in Seville, he was looking one way and she was looking the other way, and he could have driven a double-decker bus between the two of them. Such was the hostility. We went to Glasgow for the Glasgow Garden Festival. Charles and Diana were seen happily together among the crowds but they had actually arrived quite separately in different aeroplanes. We were living a life. We were covering up for the fact that the marriage was dead. The piece de resistance in terms of uh, the ending of the marriage was South Korea. They looked like Mr. and Mrs. Glum. They looked like two people, A, who didn't want to be in each other's company, and B, who didn't particularly want to be in South Korea. It says just how bad it had got that divorce, even Queen Elizabeth, looked like the solution, not the problem. The Queen intervening to say enough is enough, the time has come to divorce, was really giving closure to something that was going to happen at some point in the near future. The idea of the Queen ordering her son to divorce would have been unthinkable in a previous era. In the early 1950s, the possibility that her sister might wed a married palace equerry with children led to a crisis that ended with the princess giving up the man she loved. I remember Peter Townsend was very good looking. He was a war hero. The king adored him. He was very romantic because every evening they all went riding off into the sunset. And that, I think, was the first time that, you know, they sort of, I suppose, fell in love. Lady Glen Connor has known the royal family her whole life. She was the queen's maid of honor at the coronation is Margaret's lady-in-waiting and close friend. This is a picture of me, Princess Margaret, the Queen, and Princess Margaret is looking at my feet. And when she was staying with me, we were looking at their photographs. I said, why are you looking at my feet? And she said, well, because you had silver shoes. I had brown ones. I was so jealous of your silver shoes. Anyway, Princess Margaret and I did have grape farm, 
And in those days, we had this nursery footman, and we were always hiding behind doors to get boo, you know, when he came along with his tray. And uh, I can remember the Queen saying, Margaret Anne, what are you doing? Uh, are you behaving? Of course we weren't. <laughs> The traditional picture of Princess Margaret is that she was the naughty one while her elder sister was the goody-goody two-shoes. And there's a lot of truth in that. Her father absolutely adored her. He couldn't believe he'd created this beautiful creature. I mean, he always used to say, Lilibet is my pride and Margaret is my joy. It's difficult to think back as to the extraordinary glamour and good looks. She was a pocket Venus. She was absolutely the Princess Di of her age. Margaret had the world at her feet, but it came crumbling down when her father died and her sister became queen. I remember um, at the coronation, we arrived back at Buckingham Palace and the queen skipped along the passage and uh, with, with us and then behind her came the Duke of Edinburgh and um, the Queen Mother, and they're behind that Princess Margaret, looking so sad. And I remember saying, Ma'am, you look so sad. And she said, of course I do. She said, I lost my beloved father and my sister, because she was Queen, she'd moved into Buckingham Palace, and she said, I've got to go and live at Clarence House with my mother. Princess Margaret had turned to Peter Townsend in her distress. When he divorced his wife, she told the Queen she wished to marry this man 16 years her senior. In those days, being divorced was a really big, you know, no-no. <laughs> and people were very shocked. They felt he'd taken advantage. Princess Margaret was so much younger than him. And of course, Peter Townsend was staff. When the Queen's private secretary, Tommy Lassells, heard about this, he said to Townsend, you must be either mad or bad. Uh, you're, you're, you're intruding in this way into... Less than 20 years after the abdication, the very mention of the word divorce in palace, government and church circles caused grave concern. Townsend was sent to Brussels and the Queen asked Margaret to wait a year. And so the traditional story begins to unfold of an unhappy princess thwarted in love by the establishment. But documents released by the National Archives rewrite that history. What we see here is that actually by 1955, Anthony Eden, himself a divorcee, and his government have decided that actually she can marry. In fact, they're going to give us some more money. So all this provided that she should receive on her marriage a further sum of 9,000 a year in addition to the 6,000 a year which she has already. This is the government's plan in the event that Princess Margaret and Group Captain Townsend are going to get married. And she would have been aware of this. Ministers understand that it is Princess Margaret's wish despite her renunciation of her right to the succession, she should continue to live in the United Kingdom and to carry out her public duties as a member of the royal family. So what they're saying is we're, we're happy with her carrying on being royal, we're happy with her staying in the country, we're happy with this marriage. The one thing that will have to change is that she herself cannot be queen and nor can her children. Life would really not have changed very dramatically at all for Princess Margaret. But what we do know from other correspondence in this file, including a remarkable letter from the princess herself, is that it wasn't a sort of crazy love affair by the stage. This is the princess writing to the prime minister. It's a very honest letter. It's really rather touching. She's saying, I'm not gonna see him during this time, but in October I shall be returning to London and he will then be taking his annual leave. And only really then can I make up my mind. She says here, it's only by seeing him in this way that I feel I can properly decide whether I can marry him or not. Inevitably, he has a young woman uh, who was initially head over heels in love with this man, but possibly after all this time now, having had all these people pouring over her relationship, maybe it's, it's started to rub off. Maybe she's started to think, you know what, I'll think again. Within a couple of months, the couple would have made up their mind and the princess issued her famous statement, say, mindful of the teachings of the church, she's not going to go ahead with it. It doesn't happen. Some people absence makes the heart grow fonder. But I think it does make you think exactly what you're going to give up. I think during the wait, she started to enjoy herself again. Her friends rallied round. I think, personally, if the king had lived, she would have married somebody more suitable. And I did once ask Princess Margaret about her set 
among all of them, who would you might have married? And she said, Sonny Bramford, more suitable. She would have had a palace, of course. The demands of the crown would not only pit sister against sister, but husband against wife. He wasn't even allowed to call his children by his own name. He became emasculated. Really sounds as though it threw him into something like a depression. When George VI died, aged just 56, in 1952, it sent shockwaves through the entire family. Not only did Princess Elizabeth take on the heavy responsibility of the crown, but her husband had to give up the career he loved. This posed a massive strain on uh, the Queen's marriage to Prince Philip, uh, because Prince Philip um, uh, imagined, with good reason, that he was going to have a good career in the Navy. Suddenly, she went from being a naval wife to Queen, and he went from being a naval officer in command of his own ship to being a consort, to walking three steps behind his wife, which totally, totally went against the grain for this man, who is the ultimate alpha male. He wanted to modernise and streamline the monarchy. And, of course, the courtiers weren't having any of this. Prince Philip came up against plenty of opposition the palace old guard. They used to refer to these establishment figures as the men with moustaches. And he's not allowed anywhere near red boxes, he's not allowed anywhere near prime ministerial audiences. He's very much kept at arm's length. He wasn't even allowed to call his children by his own name. He became emasculated. I mean, he, he said at one point, what am I? Just, uh, am I nothing more than a bloody amoeba? It really sounds as though it threw him into something like a depression. He began living this slightly raffish life. Um, his membership of the famous Thursday Club, a lunch club, you know, with other young men about town, but also with a certain number of party girls. It must have been a very difficult period for her. She knew that her husband was hurting and that it was difficult for him and that some people were not treating him very well. A solution seemed to lie in the newly completed Britannia. Philip would open the Olympic Games in Australia and then tour the far-flung islands of the Commonwealth aboard the royal yacht. It was to fly the flag, of course, but perhaps it was also to give Prince Philip a little time back at sea and a little time away from the constraints of his role. But that all went wrong when one of the close associates the prince, uh, Mike Parker, was summoned back to England to appear in the divorce courts. And that tar spread. The divorce of his close friend, coupled with Philip's four-month absence, was enough to open the floodgates of speculation about the state of the royal couple's marriage. There were rumours that not everything was right in the marriage. For the first time ever, the Queen issued an official denial saying it was quite true that there was a rift. For added emphasis, she made the Duke a prince on his return home. It must have been a crisis in the early marriage, and it's the sort of crisis that's only possible to negotiate if you actually love the person you're married to. It has been the great royal love story. It's the longest royal marriage in history. It's one of the many records uh, that the Queen can lay claim to. I suspect it's probably the one she's, she holds most dear. I remember the Queen, if the Duke was arriving back from an engagement, she would sort of perk up a bit and become a sort of smiley and relaxed. The Duke of Edinburgh would start fiddling with his hair or adjusting his buttons when he was going in to see the Queen. Unlike some of the other royal marriages, she took on somebody her own size. And I think she's appreciated over the years the fact that he is the one person who can actually say exactly what he thinks to her. There's a lot of intimacy, almost in crime is that you're these two people on this very, very strange journey and with this unique life, and I think that there's a very, very powerful bond. As Harry famously said, I don't think she could have done it without him. Today, the young royals have more freedom than ever before to marry who they want. 
William, without a doubt, tore up royal history because Kate was a commoner. She was a regular girl from the home counties. But putting duty first is still the number one quality in any royal marriage. There is a sort of tick list that has to be met. Discretion, duty, and putting duty before self, most importantly. And the Queen has very much been the personification of that. Prince William must look at his grandparents' relationship, which has endured 70 years, a great example of a successful matrimony, and I'm sure he hopes that for himself too. William certainly seems to have had this in mind when he proposed to Kate. I do think that William always has one eye to the fact that he is going to be king, so whomever he married is going to be queen. I think it helped that Catherine was a personality who is quite publicly put wrong, does she? Prince William um, lives next door to me up here. I see them shopping. Duchess of Cambridge has done a really good job. She hasn't put herself forward, which was what happened with um, the, the Princess of Wales. And she's a glorious looking and sweet and perfect, but she lets Prince William take the lead, and I think that is what the Duchess of Sussex may have to learn, that, um, you know, that's what we want in the royal family. Kate had the benefit of 10 years knowing William to size up the demand of royal life before they married. For Meghan, it was different. Meghan has had a normal life, <laughs> if an acting Hollywood career can be called a normal life. I think they're massively in love, and I think together they are a very powerful couple. I think they both realise that they have this public position. It's, it's, it's global. And I've been told by A's that they want to change the world. I think the challenges for the Sussexes will be balancing that sense of duty and the life they want as private people as a family. Like the Queen, both William and Harry have chosen partners who are their equals. Women they love, but who share their vision for a relevant monarchy that's a positive force in the world. But the challenge remains. Will they be able to live with the conflicting demands of love and duty? Only time will tell. Next time, another difficult marriage between the royal family and the press. Stay there. Stay there. Meghan felt from an early stage that the British press was out to get her. Suddenly she thought, this is a lie. She had no sense of self-preservation, let alone decorum. They said the pictures, and I agreed to pay close to a million pounds. Prince Harry. He's married an American, he's married a divorcee, and without a doubt, this has been a very fast moving royal romance. Yes, behind the scenes, there were some questions being asked, just to make sure that Harry was sure, because of course, you know, divorce is something that has tainted the House of Windsor. The spectre of divorce has been hanging over the Windsor dynasty since 1936, when Edward VIII chose love over duty and abdicated rather than give up Wallace Simpson. The same loyal welcome, the amazing scenes of enthusiasm that mark him as undoubtedly deserving his well-earned title, the most popular man in the world. Despite his huge crowd appeal, Edward VIII was behind the scenes obsessed by Mrs. Simpson. Wallace Simpson was an American adventuress in the words of Queen Mary. She absolutely 